Hello everyone and welcome to Washington Square Mall in Indianapolis, Indiana. I'm your cruise director Kristen and do we ever have a lot of history to go over here. Every mall has a story and I truly enjoy putting in the work to find each one's unique history, no matter how many I go to. By the way, if this is your first time watching, welcome, and if you like what you see, please consider subscribing to help this channel grow and to get videos like this in front of more people like you. I am on the fence about whether I consider this mall dead or not. It's actually pretty well occupied, about 60 to 70 percent, but we have three out of five empty anchors and the lone national anchor, Target, doesn't open into the mall anymore. There was a respectable amount of traffic in the main corridors in the overcast Friday afternoon I was here, too. There are very few national chains here. Most stores are independently owned mom and pop operations, which is actually pretty cool. There's a real sense of entrepreneurship among the tenants here, a sense of pride. I told the owner of Gamer Loot I would give him a shout out in my video, so here it is. They have a ton of tabletop and RPG games and lots of space to play them. I was enticed by the shelf full of Catan expansions in the window. It's a nice place run by a nice dude and you should check it out. This is a deceptively large mall too. It's all one level and it's just under 1 million square feet. When you're outside, there are so many large anchor buildings that you can't really take in the size of the entire complex from most angles. I got inside and was surprised every time I turned a corner that it just kept going. At the very least, it's a great place to get some climate controlled exercise. Washington Square Mall opened on October 17, 1974. It was the third of three square malls in Indianapolis developed by the Edward J. DeBartolo Company, preceded by Lafayette Square in 1968 and Cashelton Square in 1972. It featured eight fountains, a total of 88 matching mirrored mobiles hanging from the ceiling, and a 10-foot clock tower that sat upon a brick base. It was also, to my amusement, home to two stores that specialized solely in pants, just pants in the bottom half. I guess Pants Explosion was contained up north in Logansport and decided not to go for the Pants Store hat trick. The confirmed anchor lineup at the 1974 opening included William H. Block, Ellis Ayers, Sears, and J.C. Penney. A fifth anchor, Lazarus, seems to have opened shortly after the rest of the mall. Wikipedia lists it as an opening tenant, but the Indianapolis Star published a special section about the grand opening that included a map, and Lazarus wasn't on it. I was able to confirm that it was open by 1982, which is the oldest advertisement for the store I found. 
If you know, please let me know in the comments so I can solve the mystery. As you look around, you really get the feeling DeBartolo was trying to swing for the fences in here in terms of making it modern, maybe even futuristic for 1974, as many of the design elements feel more 80s than 70s. This mall hasn't changed a whole lot since it opened other than some fresh paint and the removal of things like fountains, and this feels a decade newer than some of the older, well-preserved DeBartolo malls I've visited, like Upper Valley Mall that was only a year older than this. The first change in the Anchor lineup came in 1987 when Lazarus purchased Blocks, and since they already had a Lazarus at Washington Square, the building was sold to Montgomery Ward, who opened their location here in 1988. Montgomery Ward stuck around till 1997. After that, it was demolished with a Target reopening on its former plot. Following their founder's passing, the remaining DeBartolo Group malls were sold to Simon Properties in 1996. 2001 and 2002 were a rough couple of years for Washington Square. J.C. Penney closed in early 2001, and the following year Lazarus closed as well. Around this time, the local press began speculating about the rapid deterioration of the retail landscape on Indianapolis's east side, not only due to Washington Square's difficulties, but also that of the mall Washington Square fundamentally replaced, Eastgate Commerce Mall, which was also owned by Simon Properties at the time. There were also big box closures in the neighborhood at the time that included service merchandise and Levitt's furniture. The city offered tax abatements to Dick's Sporting Goods, who rebuilt a new store on the former Lazarus plot, and to a new Curasota Cinemas that opened in the mall's parking lot. The former JCPenney was reoccupied by Burlington Coat Factory. By 2007, the mall was able to boast a bit of a revival with the addition of a few other inline tenants, such as Buffalo Wild Wings and Stephen Berry's, which was one of the best performing stores in the mall when the chain went under in 2008. The revival was short-lived. In early 2008, both The Gap and Macy's, the store Ellis Ayers had become only a couple years earlier, closed for good. Simon had over-leveraged the property and the cracks were beginning to show. Very little investment was being made into the property as they shifted their resources to their better performing malls, and by 2014 it had been returned to its lender, Wells Fargo. This seems to happen like clockwork these days, but once a mall goes into a foreclosure from an A-tier mall operator like Simon, you can bet that one of the B-tier owners will be waiting in the wings to snap it up, and that's what happened here. In 2016, Kohan Investment Properties stepped in to purchase Washington Square for $2.5 million, a bargain when the mall had been appraised at $14 million only two years earlier. The Kohan years were a mixed bag for this mall. They were who introduced the concept of offering rock-bottom rent prices to independent store owners, which drew interest from vendors from the local flea market. How rock-bottom? Some tenants were paying as little as $400 a month for their storefronts. Some fared better than others. It was reported at the time some of the storefronts would be occupied for as little as a few weeks. It was, and continues to be, a novel concept for the mall, one that seems to be working out okay for them right now. However, the property deteriorated under Kohan's leadership, leading to their almost losing it to a tax foreclosure after they found themselves in arrears to the tune of $600,000 with the county. A payment was made at the last minute to prevent themselves from losing the mall, and a new owner, Durga Properties, took over in 2019. In early 2020, it was reported that they had 62 of the mall's 80 storefronts leased, and while they have understandably lost a few during the pandemic, it still feels pretty lively in here, and they have security and maintenance workers keeping everything running every day. The Sears Wing seems to have tenants in place, however, not a lot of the spaces are occupied by businesses that are open all the hours the mall is, such as a church and community center. 
There's also the dungeon. I had to look up what this place is, and it turns out it's an escape room, which sounds interesting. Since I was here pretty early in the day after school started, it's understandable that they weren't open. So is this mall dead? No, I don't think it is. It's down, but it's not out. Are these halls going to be filled again with national chains? Probably not. However, I read over and over again how people on the east side wanted places to shop that would help the neighborhood. And locally owned businesses will invest back in the community many times over what their corporate counterparts will. Maybe that's the key in being able to keep the doors open on these well-preserved hidden gems. When you're able to walk into a mall that feels like it's run by your neighbors, you can feel good about supporting them. Here at Washington Square, everyone is in this together, carving out their own corner of the world. Thank you for watching. A lot more is on its way. A very special thank you to our patrons for helping make this very productive trip possible. If you are interested in becoming a patron, please see the link in the description. As always, I'm your cruise director, Kristen, and I'll see you all again very soon.